How's the microphone? Can everybody hear me? That description sounds rather woo, actually. Um, I'm not so much in the woo. I know it can sound a bit woo, uh, but I'm actually much more on the technical end, although I'm pretty interested in how uh, the brain meets the woo, and that's a little bit what we're going <laughs> to... A little bit of what we're going to talk about tonight. We'll see how successful I am at it. Um, actually, I study um, philosophy of cognitive neuroscience at the University of Edinburgh, and I'm working with Andy Clark on theories of the predictive brain. So this is very non-woo. This is very real neuroscience. Um, but uh, my interest, because I have a kind of split life, I have a kind of research life, and I have a kind of uh, spiritual life where I'm doing and teaching meditation quite a lot, um, I'm really interested in where these things come together. And I think... Uh, a really fascinating thing about our modern science is that the more we come to know about the brain, actually the more we're starting to see how these old wisdom traditions like Buddhism, um, like mystical Christianity, uh, like the yogas in um, India, um, how they actually are saying something very important and very practical and very real. Um, and so, well, it sounds a bit woo-ish. Uh, try to be cool. And if it gets a bit woo, just give me a sign and I'll, I'll pull it back, okay? So let's start in the the non-woo end um, in, well, maybe not so non-woo. In 1961, Robert Heinlein wrote a beautiful cult classic science fiction novel called The Strange in a Strange Land. Science fiction fans? Yes? Nice. Uh, in it, he coined a term called grokking, and grokking is the way that Martians communicate with one another, and grokking is a really beautiful word, I mean, fake word, um, and it has a beautiful fake etymology, uh, which comes something, it has something to do with water, and has something to do with life, and has something to do with digesting, and so what Robert Heinlein was getting at was that the way that Martians communicate is they somehow drink each other in, okay, so they don't just hear each other, and they don't just see each other, uh, they somehow digest one another, and that's how they speak, which is pretty cool. Um, and Robert Heinlein is pretty explicit when he says that, uh, well, Martians grok, humans do not. Humans kind of uh, you know, speak at each other, and then we, we hear from each other, and then we think things. But it's not this kind of digestive process. Um, lo and behold, as we're uncovering the deep mysteries of the brain, uh, we find out that, in fact, humans grok. This is exactly how we perceive and communicate with one another. So let me outline that for you. We used to have an idea of perception, and then I'm going to ask everybody, so just, just tell me if this is the way you thought the brain worked, okay? Because this is all changing in the last 20 years. Okay, so at one time we thought perception worked like this. Uh, first you see something, yes? So the brain is a kind of passive bundle of organs, and it waits for the world to come through the retina, and then the brain kind of decodes the signals. So far? Yes, is that how you think the brain works generally? Okay, so passive signals go, wow! And then the brain goes, it starts the thinking apparatus and goes, well, it could be this. Yeah, so there's some lines and there's some shapes and there's some surfaces and there's a dog. Okay, we're still doing the thinking. Yes, there's a dog. And then there's more thinking. So we start with perception and there's thinking, thinking, thinking. And then there's more thinking and the thinking says, well, what kind of dog is it? And you say, well, it's a dangerous dog. Okay, and then more thinking. Well, if it's a dangerous dog, what do we do? Well, uh, more thinking. Well, maybe we should run. Sorry, am I stepping inside of the camera? <laughs> uh, should we run? Okay, and then what happens at the end? Well, then we run. Okay, so we have this kind of perception thinking, action, sandwich, yeah? Signals come in, brain works it out, output. Is that about what we think, generally just kind of layman terms of how, right, this is completely wrong. I mean, I point out, I point out something uh, really fascinating, right? Where are emotions in there? Where is empathy, where is compassion in, in, that, in that little model? Isn't that funny? You know, Descartes, 300 years ago, kind of messed things up. I mean, he's a beautiful man and said lots of beautiful things. But one of the things that he got really wrong was is that um, the soul is kind of in the brain, and the brain drives us around like we're a kind of vehicle or something. You know, so we have this perception process, thinking and acting, but where's emotion in? Maybe emotion comes as like part of the, the action. Okay, this is not the way it is. So what we're learning now is that the brain is not a passive bundle of neuro... And I'm going to get around to compassion. Don't worry, okay? Um, the brain is not a passive bundle of neurons. In fact, it's proactive. It's radically proactive. Um, the brain is using multiple streams of information. So it's not only using what's coming in from the world, but it's using its expectations, its predictions, its memories about things that have happened in the past, and also your embodied resonance. So your feeling about the environment, it gets wrapped up with all of these other streams of information into a kind of predictive crunch. And here's the amazing thing, and, and I'll, just, I'll outline it a little bit clearer in one second. The amazing thing is what we perceive is the crunch. We don't see the signal, we see the crunch. Okay, so let me say that again, okay? So, Let's say there's, there's a, a, an apple, okay? And so the signals from the apple come and they hit my eye, and then this is actually how it goes. So it's not this kind of sandwich. Instead, what happens is the brain makes a best first guess about what those kinds of signals could mean. 
that initial gist guess activates the body in some way. So that your body prepares to respond in the way it has before to that kind of guess. Yeah, so emotions already are here and our tendency to act. Our tendency to act in the way that we feel starts grabbing hold of different memories that were associated with those kind of feelings in the past. Okay? That gets spit back up into the neural apparatus and we get uh, a kind of sharper prediction. So our prediction gets better now that we have a bit more information. Okay? And that, as the prediction gets better, it changes the body, which changes our action, which grabs new memories, which changes the prediction. Okay? We haven't seen anything yet, by the way. Okay, so it is a bit messy, isn't it? Okay, and then it, it keeps going like this. It keeps going around and around in a circle until finally the, the streams of information are good enough that they, they meet the signal well enough uh, that we have a perception. Okay, now let me just lay out why that's cool in case you don't know, okay? It's cool because our actual perception of one another has already within it all of our understanding, all of our beliefs, our feelings about one another, our expectations, our memories. That's all part of the package of seeing each other. So we don't see each other and then think something. We don't see somebody, we don't see somebody and then feel something. We thinkingly, feelingly see people. It's cool, right? Okay. So this is a bit like grokking, I think, in the, in the, in the sense that uh, we don't just see each other. Um, our, our empathic resonance with one another gets prepackaged. It gets packaged into our perception of one another so that we see each other as rich and beautiful, lively, emotional human beings. Um, so that's really beautiful. Okay. But there's a dark side to this brain, and then I'm going to come back to compassion, why I think compassion is the kind of medicine for this style of brain. There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a potential downfall to this style of brain. One of the outcomes of this brain is uh, that the world isn't somehow out there externally, that we are somehow co-creating the world. Yeah? So we don't, the world isn't just here, and then we passively perceive it. Instead, our beliefs and our knowledge and how we feel about the world and our mood and all of that, that, that makes up the meat of what we experience in the world. That's a really important thing to know. Because if your life isn't working out the way you want it to, it may not be because of the world. It's partially because of what we believe and what we think, how we feel, who we interact with. These, this is all part and parcel. And I'm, I'm not talking, you know, I think sometimes we can think of perception as quite a kind of, well, it's just perception. But perception is your whole thing. I mean, perception is the whole thing. It's our whole life. It's our whole world. And how we feel and what we know get wrapped up into it. And if we, um, if we don't take that seriously and we start believing that the world is kind of strongly out there apart from us, then we can feel very trapped by that, I think. Okay. So we have a beautiful brain that's capable of rolling together our feelings and our understanding and our knowledge into a very rich, as Andy Clark says, a rich world-revealing perception. One of the problems is, is that this brain uh, can work better or worse at this. I mean, I don't think this is so far out. Let me give you a really kind of quick, easy example I think we'll all nod our heads at, okay? Uh, we take an optimist and a pessimist on one side of town, okay, and then they take the bus here, okay, and then they get here, and then I bring them up on stage and I say, okay, uh, how was your experience? Can, can we assume we know what they're, what they're going to say, right? The pessimist goes, man, the world is a terrible place. <laughs> you know, like, I looked out the window and Brexit, you know, and uh, there's all these people out of work, and they look just like me, so I know, like, I'm in big trouble. And uh, the bus smelt like urine. And, of course, it's Edinburgh, so it's always raining, always raining. It's like, why do we even live here? Uh, and that's their world, that's their world, you know, that's actually the world that they experience. And then you ask the optimist the exact same question, same exact world, same exact bus, let's say they're even on the same bus, okay? He says, wow, what a life, you know, what a beautiful life. They were, I don't know, puppies, and uh, the sky, you know, it was rainy, but there was that one patch of beautiful blue sky, I really cherish that because it's Edinburgh, you know, I mean, that's very rare. Um, <laughs> And, you know, Brexit, but, you know, there's other things that are great, and, and that's their world. That's actually their world. That's really important. That's really important, because we have to, like, spend time in our worlds. You know? So to know that the world isn't somehow strongly there, but we're all the time co-creating our world, we're making up our world, and that, that making up of the world has a lot to do with what we know and, and how we feel. Okay, so we've got a beautiful brain that's capable of making this beautiful, rich, understanding of one another, but the exact same mechanisms can fall either to the better or to the worse, to the skillful or the unskillful. So what do we do? I mean, one of the, one of the take home messages you should take from this is that mental and emotional cultivation is extremely important. Um, cultivating 
uh, good skillful mental qualities and good skillful emotional qualities, this is radically important. And it's not just a kind of add-on. I mean, I, in, in my field, while I'm talking about emotion in the brain, still we typically think of emotion as these kind of uninteresting leftovers. But you know what we're interested in is reason, you know, logic, uh, thinking, you know, but not emoting. I mean, and, and when, you, when you start to see this brain where these things are entangled, then how we actually feel, how we learn how to actually, how we learn to skillfully feel, it's so important. So what do we do? How do we care for such a brain? How do we care for this kind of dynamic, multi-stream crunching brain? This is where the woo comes, okay? So hold on tight. Um, for 3,000 years, we've had a beautiful paradigm, and Buddhism is an excellent paradigm. Um, uh, this is essentially a practice of, uh, of teaching mental and emotional cultivation, and compassion and empathy training has been a part of that program for a very, very long time. And they take it quite seriously. And, and I, think it, I think it's something that we should be able to take quite seriously as well if we know that we have this kind of brain and that actually the way we feel turns into our reality. And so I just want to quickly, I've got two minutes, just going to quickly point out two practices that the Buddhists recommend, and I hope you'll see how they're applicable to this kind of brain. The first, and they're both compassion practices. The first one is compassion about the moment. Um, the Buddhists would say uh, there, there's something in interesting and very important about compassionately opening to what is happening right now. Yeah, Look, just right now, right here. Not in our memories, not yesterday, not the next talk. Just be here, be here. Okay, it's easy right now because maybe this is a bit interesting. You know, I don't know, maybe it's not. Um, but uh, try when it's, when it's a bit difficult also. Also, you welcome in the present moment when it's a bit difficult. Seems like a very easy practice, very simple practice. If I can just give you one um, kind of awesome experimental fact. Um, at one time, we thought that at age 25, the brain had reached its maximum density. And from 25 until the end of your life, the, slow is, the brain is in a slow decay. Okay? So, so anybody here who's over 25, sorry. Uh, <laughs> You know, it's all downhill from here. Okay, as Jesus would say, here's the good news. Uh, that experiment was not the way it actually is. Uh, that experiment was done back in the 1950s, and the people who were being experimented on typically had one style of life set up at 25. And they played cards with the Millers every Tuesday and had the same job and did more or less the same things. And so what happens is the brain starts slowly uh, just, just consolidating that style of living. Okay. They've recently shown that if you take 15 minutes a day and don't go to the past and don't go to the future, but just consolidate here, just be here. You don't have to close your eyes. You don't have to go like, mm, nothing like this, okay? Just be here. Just be here where you are for 15 minutes a day. Same brain mass between 25 and 75. Awesome, right? I come from a long line of car dealers, uh, and so sometimes I joke that I try to sell meditation, but that's my best sales pitch. Um, <laughs> 15 minutes a day of compassionately engaging with the present moment, whatever the present moment has, um, at 75, you'll have the same robust prefrontal cortex you have at 25. Nice. Prefrontal cortex is very important. Yes, it does all the nice human things. Okay, uh, and just one more thing. Yes, one more thing. Um, the, there is a way that we can uh, practice empathy. We talk a lot about compassion and empathy, and we talk a lot about it being a good thing. Everybody nods and say, oh, yes, we're here, and we're talking about compassion and empathy. Great. And you'll go home, and you'll think about it, and that's lovely, and we'll talk a bit about it. But how do you actually do it? How do you actually do it? How do you do how do you do empathy? Isn't that amazing? It's like, it's like how, do you, how do you feel? Or how do you love? Can you imagine nobody's ever talked to you about how to love? As if we're just supposed to know? Unbelievable. It's like sex and death. Nobody talks to us about it, right? We're just supposed to know. And then we show up and they're both really scary, I think. Um, so how do we practice empathy? This is a very simple technique and then I'll get off. Um, uh, the Buddhists for a very long time have this beautiful technique. What you do is you imagine somebody you love, somebody you really care about, and then you imagine some of the challenges they go through, which is very easy because you love them and you probably know them, okay? And then you switch places with them, so you step into their shoes, and you try to feel what it feels like to be them, and this turns on all the empathy systems, yeah? And then you step back to you, and you take all that charge, and you send it as a wish. May you be well, may you be happy, may you be free, you know, may you be good, okay? So that doesn't sound like it's much of a stretch because it's somebody we love. But here's the trick, okay? Here's the rub. Now start on somebody you love and then do uh, somebody you like and then do a stranger and then do somebody who's a bit annoying and then do Darth Vader, okay? <laughs> and, and, and do them. And Darth Vader is actually really a great one, right? I mean, he was Anakin Skywalker. He balanced the force. I mean, this is a nice thing. Anyway, so you start, you start with the one you love and you work outwards. So just before I go, if you could just look at somebody on your table and don't do it in a kind of creepy way, just bring somebody to mind at your table. Okay, somebody you don't know, a stranger at your table, okay? 
Now I want you to use your kind of sixth sense uh, to intuit some of the challenges they go through in their life. If that's difficult, just raise your hand. If you're not sure, you're, you know, your ESP isn't working. Are you a bit scared to put up your hand because you're not sure? Okay. I think for the most people, we, we probably don't think that's so easy. But I'll tell you, there, if you are here and you are human and you are in this realm and you are in this life, uh, I can tell you lots of things that we share. We've all been sad. We've all been scared. We've all been confused. We all, we've all felt like we we're going to throw up and we had to stand and talk in front of a bunch of people in a room. Okay? <laughs> We've all lost loved ones and cried pathetically in our rooms by ourselves and hoped nobody heard us or saw us. And we've all been forced to be around those we don't love. We share that in common. And if you know that we share that in common, then you can start working towards seeing each other um, in a more compassionate way. And that compassion and empathy training, that is an expansion of the heart. And as the heart expands, let's just go right back to the beginning of the talk. That's going to be the kind of thing that goes into this crunch. So what we perceive, the world we actually show up into, isn't, isn't a world of kind of storefronts. It ends up being a world where we are here together. And isn't it amazing that even in our suffering, um, we can come back together. In fact, because of our suffering, we can somehow come back together. Um, okay, so there's the mission. I wish I had more time. Thanks so much.